Hi, guys. Uh, thank you for coming here this morning. Um, as many of you already know, we're involved with an organization called Reconstructed Search Week International. Uh, it's shortened to research. I've been involved with the organization since 2002. And in 2002, I took a whole year off. And uh, what I did during that year was just go to different places all around the, the world, developing countries, did surgery, gave lectures. I probably caught every kind of parasite you could ever imagine from that year. The things I ate, uh, I'll tell you about another time. But uh, it was a tough year, but it was really, really rewarding. And after I came back, I stayed involved with the organization. I joined Long Island Plastic Surgical Group. And now, Long Island Plastic Surgical Group is a partner with the organization. So Dr. Rena has been to India. Um, Dr. Simpson has also been to India. Dr. Glickman has been to Ecuador. So, and I'm still involved with the organization. So the LIPS doctors now support the organization, go on trips with the organization, are visiting professors for the organization. And I want to give you just a little uh, insight into the kind of work that we do, the involvement with Long Island Plastic Surgical Group. And I'm doing this just through a trip I made in April of this year to uh, India. So a little bit about the organization. Um, one of the issues uh, in, in the developing world is there's a, there's a lack of access to surgical care. Um, many of our patients that I'm operating on will walk or take buses or spend their life savings just to go three or four days to get to a place where the surgery can be done. Uh, a lot of times in these places there are no surgeons who are capable, there are no plastic surgeons. and it's kind of different. When, when you're sick here today, if you have cancer, you go to the hospital and, and you get treated. And, and if you have an issue with a cleft palate, for example, which we do a lot of, or a burn, or any of these plastic surgical issues, you can't just go to the hospital. Either there's no hospital in town, there's no plastic surgeon in town, or you can't afford it. Which, it's kind of one of the biggest tragedies in plastic surgery, because a lot of times, a cleft lip takes me 45 minutes. If you're old enough, I can do it under local. And people say, no, no, it's, it's, a, it's a life changing procedure when you do something like that. When you see it, when you actually do it and you realize when you talk to the patient, it's actually not just a life changing, it's a life making procedure. These are patients who have a very small defect in terms of the amount of surgery that needs to be done. But the life impact is tremendous because they, they tell you they can't get married, they can't get a job. There are a lot of stigma associated with having a cleft lip, for example. So they, uh, they don't have a life. Uh, they live outside of town, and, and, and there's, there's all these um, kind of myths in some of these countries where they think one of the reasons you get a cleft lip is because you see somebody with a cleft lip when you're pregnant. So they don't want these people around. They, in some countries, they also think that, you know, part of what happens to you in your life is, 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 is the way you've acted, and they think that somehow this thing, this bad thing that has happened to you has, has, has some kind of um, bearing on, on, on who you've been. So. Uh, patients who have horrible burns, you know, their hands are, are burned shut, and they can't get a job because you you know they need to have their hands to do most work in these countries, or their arms are stuck at their sides, or their arms are stuck down, or people just don't want them uh, around because they're they're disfigured. So they have a lot of, of issues uh, surrounding in plastic surgery in particular. And why is that? Because it's something that we could actually make an impact on. Cancer is very, very hard. You need an intensive care unit. You need to be there months and months and months. With plastic surgery, we can go in, we can do the surgery, we can take care of the issue, and then it's done. And, and that's why what we do has a very, very high impact in terms of its cost effectiveness. So we have, and I'll give you a little bit more about what we do with research, but they've even taken it steps and steps beyond that. So, uh, our vision is to have all people have access to reconstructive surgery. And uh, a lot of organizations are doing this, and uh, what's interesting and unique about Reconstructive Surgery International is we're doing it in, in, in several different levels in every way possible. Um, and again, they're, they're the, one of the most cost-effective ways of, of helping these people. Uh, people always say, you know, doing a lot of organizations are doing vaccinations and we're doing a lot of these things, but in terms of surgery, Reconstructive surgery is, is probably the most cost effective. And the reason is, is because you can actually set it up, you can go in, it's not like taking out someone's gallbladder, we have to be there all the time. We can actually go in and train the surgeons there, work with the surgeons there, 
and uh, perform these surgeries in a cost-effective way. Um, for every $1 spent uh, strengthening the local surgical community, $10 was generated through enhanced health and increased productivity. And like I said before, if you have somebody and they've had a burn and their head is fused down, they can't look up, or their arms are fused, their sides, they can't work. So we go in, we can probably do a two-hour procedure, and that person can now work for the rest of their lives. We have patients, very, very common, who can't walk. And they have to either stay home, or they're a beggar, or someone has to carry them if they need to go somewhere. And we can go in, we can fix their legs, and uh, we've had patients walking one week post-op, mm -hmm. where they haven't walked in years and years. Wow. Um, so you've heard the old adage, um, give a man a fish, you feed him once, teach a man to fish, you feed him for years. So the whole purpose of the organization is to work in these countries, work in these communities, and get to the point where that country and that site and those doctors are self-sufficient. Why? Because it's so much more effective if the doctors are in that country working on their own, doing things on their own. You know, it costs several hundred dollars for us to fly over there and do a surgery. It costs probably one quarter of that for that surgery to be done by that doctor locally. Now your doctor's local, they have a problem, you can go back and see him. If there's an issue, you can actually um, you know, have that doctor local. So that's really the goal. Um, but we also do several other things. If there's no doctor to work with, we will go and we'll just do what we can as a team trip. We'll do surgeries, we'll always have someone the patient can follow up with if there's a problem. We'll be very conservative with our surgeries, but we'll go in and we'll do surgery for two weeks. Um, then sometimes we work with the local doctors, and many of these doctors, there aren't uh, enough trained plastic surgeons. So we will go in and we'll train the plastic surgeons, and in this way, that surgeon can then offer these surgeries. So a patient will travel four days, and they can't get to a place where there's a plastic surgeon. Well, now they can travel four days and get to a plastic surgeon, and we always work with people who have a generous heart and have that kind of uh, capacity to help the poor in that country. So we're not training guys who are going to go off and do facelifts. We're training guys who are going to be burn surgeons, who are going to be hand surgeons, who are going to be cleft surgeons, and have a definite interest um, uh, in working with the indigent and treating people for free. And that's what I'm going to talk about in our site in the India. So we mainly work in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Chang is our chief medical officer, and he's really done a lot for the organization over the past few years. It's expanded us, and we have a really diverse academic faculty. So we have some of the, or many of the best plastic surgeons in the United States signed on to be teachers, instructors, do this surgery, where they'll take two weeks, a week out of their year, they'll go to these countries, and they'll work with these surgeons in these countries to bring up the quality of the surgery that's done in these countries. So I went to Dehradun. So this is a map of India, and it's right here. It's actually on the border of uh, Nepal and the Himalayas. So it's in the kind of the foothills of the Himalayas. If you want to get in a car and you can drive one hour uh, up the mountain, and you're standing at the top of the mountain, you just see the Himalayas in front of you. It's got an interesting story. This is There's a lot of schools in Dehradun because um, it's about uh, 200 miles, I think, from Delhi. And it's cooler because it's in the foothills. So that's where they put a lot of the schools because there was no air conditioning back then. There was cholera, there was malaria, there was dengue fever. And as you get higher above, there are fewer mosquitoes. And, and they would have the kids there going to school um, from Delhi. So this is kind of what you see. There's a lot of uh, cow traffic. <laughs> and cows are, cows are like, walking well, you know, it's like birds. Here, they're just they're, they're walking all over the place, and uh, it's they're sacred, so you have to be very very careful. Nothing happens to them, and uh, and they just uh, do what they want. They just kind of hang out all over the place. This is a guy just walking down the middle of the street, right in front of the hospital. Um, this is it, it takes almost two days to get there, so you're just traveling, traveling. This is us arriving in Delhi at two o'clock in the morning, and then we have to wait and board another plane in the morning to Dehradun. Then you board this other small plane in the morning, and you get to Dehradun. So after you've been on the, on the plane for about two days, then you go to the hospital, you set up the hospital, and you get ready for clinic the next day. So it's, it's, it's a pretty intense trip. Now this is the hospital uh, that was built. Incredible.
incredibly special. Um, it is one of the nicest buildings in Dehradun. It was built by Mrs. Kush and Yogi Aaron. So remember I said they were special people? So this is Dr. Uh, Yogi. He um, practiced in that town of Dehradun all his life and realized that he wanted to help the people who couldn't afford it. So he turned his entire practice and just does, burn. he was interested in burns because there are a lot of these burns in India. They, the houses people live in, which I'll show you in a little while, are very often just the size of this area I'm standing right here, and they often cook on a, an open fire. And if you're wearing a sari and you walk past the open fire, especially children, um, they're very flammable, they catch fire, and there are a lot of burns. Um, so he basically could be doing facelifts, could be doing tummy tucks, instead dedicates his life taking care of burned people in India. His son is Kush Aaron, a general surgeon, train, training under his father after doing his training in general surgery, and he shares his father's dream. So, over the years, with small donations, small donations, small donations, over the past 10 years, they saved up enough money to build this hospital. And it's one of the nicest buildings in Dehradun, and they Really, one of the nicest hospitals in Dehradun treats poor patients who can't afford it for burns. And again, research uh, and reconstructive surgery internationally has done an amazing job finding these people to work with because these are the perfect people to train. We want to make them, and they really, they're already great burn surgeons. Now they're going to be the best burn surgeons in the world as the surgeons from all over the United States and other countries come there and do cases with them and uh, being able to help these people. So we show up the first day, and this is what we see. Just all of these people, um, many of them traveling for days and days and days through the Himalayas, they get the word out, and these are all patients with burns uh, that are waiting for me to operate on. And there are students also, because uh, they're setting it up, they're going to learn also while we were there, um, medical students, PT students from the uh, local medical school on how to treat burn patients. Uh, they had it, so I dedicated the hospital. It just opened. The day before we got there, they got the elevator working. And uh, so we walk in, and uh, this is the lobby. What's interesting about the lobby is there are all pictures of Long Island plastic surgery doctors who have been there, yeah. and many of the doctors who have been there. Um, and this is, again, a beautiful uh, building in Derridu. This is um, uh, Suhei, one of the um, Nepalese surgeons who came with me who also operated. And again, she's an accomplished hand surgeon from Nepal um, who, again, is taking two weeks off to uh, train Dr. Uh, Yogi um, how to do burn hands. There was even a little shrine to Dr. Rina. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rina gets his own you can see, all the frame. I have a small little picture of me, and Dr. Rina, this is him uh, when he first came, and this is Dr. Yogi with one of his idols, and then his other idol is Dr. Rina. And this is the operating room, gorgeous operating room. Probably the nicest operating room I've been in on one of these trips. And I've been on probably 30 trips. You add it all up, I've spent over a year of my life in other countries doing this kind of stuff. And this is one of the nicest operating rooms I've ever seen, if not the most nice operating room I've ever seen. Great lighting, has windows. And this is the view from the window of the hospital. I'm oh, sorry, the, yeah, the window of the hospital. And what's interesting is, so remember I said the Himalayas are right here? So this is a hill station. So you're down here, you go up 4,000 feet, and there's a little town, I shouldn't say a little town, it's actually a decent sized town, on top of the mountain that overlooks Dehradun. So that's where you would go for the weekend. You can actually, it takes an hour to drive there, but if you wanted to walk it, you can walk it in a couple of hours if you have the, if you have the leg strain. And, you know, there are fewer mosquitoes up there, there's less malaria, it's a little bit cooler. So what people would used to do is they would, that was where they would go on vacation, to the top of the mountain, and there's hotels up there, and uh, that's called Missouri. But it's interesting, you can see kind of the Himalayas from the hospital. So, if you guys know me, you know that I cannot survive without my Starbucks in the morning. And uh, I, every first thing I do is I always ask, is there Starbucks here? Has the Starbucks arrived yet? And they said, no, this was the first year. I've been to this site five times. First time I went was in 2004. 
And I said, well, they said, well, we do have uh, Dunkin' Donuts. I said, perfect. <laughs> so what we're going to do is on the way to the hospital at 5.30 in the morning, we will stop at Dunkin' Donuts. I'll get my, I'll get my coffee. And I'll be all set. I'm like, no, 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 sorry. Dunkin' Donuts doesn't open until 10 o'clock. <laughs> That's insane. What's going on? They said, no, here, it's like a fancy dessert place. It's not like a place you want to get coffee in the morning. They do have coffee, but it opens later in the day. So, um, so they went and they got donuts. And then, you know, usually people go in there. It's kind of a special place where you get a donut, and it's very expensive in India. You can imagine. So people really, a lot of people can't afford to go to Dunkin' Donuts, um, but. You go when you have like a, a fancy dessert in the afternoon. We walked in and I said, I said, okay, I'll take three dozen donuts. Like, what, what are you crazy? Three <laughs> dozen donuts? So, and this is what the whole donkey do's over there for these roller donuts I ordered. Um, and I was able to get my coffee by one o'clock. But it was fine. And this is the view from the back of the hospital. These are sheep, oh, I'm sorry, goats. So these are goats. There's a goat field right behind the hospital. Um, hanging out in that field. And then also, right behind the hospital, these are kind of people live here. And uh, I remember saying to the to Dr. Tush, I'm like, you know there are people living behind the hospital? He goes, oh yeah. You know? And uh, he goes, these, they, that, those are like people at regular jobs, and they just happen to live behind the hospital. And you can see this is their water supply. It's a water tank. There's like a toothbrush here, and all the stuff you need to take a shower on this mat. And, you know, but I, the reason I show this is because People cook on an open fire in these um, small houses, and they, there's, that's why it's a closed space with a fire, and then that's how people get burned. And you can see this is just a shot of the water and the place where you can brush your teeth and shower. And this is the first patient I see. So the first patient who comes in in the clinic, her dress caught fire, burnt up, and burned. Her neck. Her mouth is stuck open, so she it's very hard for her to eat. Her chin is stuck to her chest, and she can't look up. So this is an example of exactly what we do and why we can make such a huge impact in someone's life. So here's somebody who can't really open her mouth. She has difficulty with that. She can't um, lift her head, and so it's hard for her. She can't work. So uh, they did this actually the week I was gone, but we can actually fix this in one surgery. We do multiple skin grafts and fix that in one surgery, probably about two hours. So yeah. two hours of general anesthesia, skin grafts, and uh, she's able to lift her head. And I'll show you a patient that looked like her and show you what she looks like, and I did a touch up on her. This is another gentleman, may not seem like a big deal, but he had a burn to the right side of his face, and now his, his eye is pulled down. Um, one of the things that we know about plastic surgery is that when you look at people and you talk to them, you're looking at their eyes, you're looking at their mouth, and then you can tell what they're thinking. And just having this tiny little pull down of the eye, it really affects his look. And he's like, I, I, it's, people don't want to be with me, this is my whole identity. And um, you can see his lip is pulled up here, and in, and in one procedure we put a skin graft here, a skin graft here, and we're able to fix him in about an hour. This is another patient. She burnt her leg, didn't get any treatment, and you can see she still has an open wound here. And her leg is fused in about the, you know, maybe 45 degree, 50 degree position. We go back. This is where she was when I first saw her. She looks great. I didn't even know she had a problem. I'm like, you look at all these patients, and one of the things is you can see how everyone is covering up their defect. Mm -hmm. She's the girl with the neck, she's the girl with the side of her face, she has the leg, she has a neck. So people live their whole lives covering up all of these defects because obviously there's a stigma that's difficult. And uh, this is another gentleman who had a bilateral cleft lip, uh, had it repaired. And this kind of points out whoever did this did the best they could. Um, but if that person had, been, you know, we can train that person and work with them, like Dr. Rotolo or one of the other cleft surgeons, he could have a lip, which really is very, very straight. It's a whistle tip deformity, and the two sides are pulled up. You know, so while he does look better, it definitely can be a little bit better. And that's why it's so important that we do these visiting professorships, and it's so important uh, that we do some training. Because then we can really, the surgery that people do do, we can really make an impact and, and, and make it better.
This is another little guy. You can see he's got an incomplete cuff lip. But the other thing that really noticed about this picture is he's very not impressed with me. <laughs> I look on his face. Um, he's got a Superman shirt, and he's got the okay, who are you? Let's get on with this face. There's another patient, also dressed burnt, burnt her neck, her neck is fused. Um, again, somebody that really, and her, her arm, you can see, is stuck, pulled like this, and the wrist is pulled down. So she really only has use of her left arm. Um, and this is someone, this time we, we fixed her arm, and next time we'll fix her neck. This is another gentleman, it's a very sad case. Um, this was about a year and a half ago. He worked in a candy making factory and was standing over the vat of candy and actually passed out and fell into the candy and got this, this horrible, horrible burn. His issue was he can't open his mouth. Obviously, he has also issues with his eyelids. And then it used to be that his eyelids were all stuck open, which is a danger because you can get corneal abrasion and go blind. So the first issue was fix his eyes such that his eyes are protected, which was done. And now the issue is he can't open his mouth. And that's that to be our next issue. And then well, each time we come, we make things a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better. This is just an example of kind of some of the things you see. This is a patient who has something called Proteus syndrome, which is what the elephant man had on his leg. And uh, sometimes we just, there are things we just can't do with what we have, uh, the facilities we have there. And this is, is one of those gentlemen that we could put down and that we couldn't help. But um, you know, we do we do see probably about two or three hundred patients in that first day. Another gentleman. Um, he's been like this for months. He uh, the electrical wires there are very low. He was um, going through, I think, to catch a kite for his son and touched the electrical wire um, where his scalp is, went in, came out his arm. He burned off his arm, he still has an open wound there. And again, you know, this gentleman has, he's gone to the doctor, there's no one to fix him except for us. And that could get, this could kill him, that could get infected, and uh, he could die. They did this actually the week after I left. They did a flap and uh, uh, I called him on the phone, it took them, they fixed, they fixed that, and they did the flap and the whole thing took about two and a half hours. Now this is a girl whose chin, used to be stuck to her chest. All this, remember I said I can fix that in a couple hours with a skin graft? This is all a full thickness skin graft that they put in and freed up her neck. So she's had this little synechia that's left, so she still can't lift her head freely. So I was able to do Z-plasties of that and um, under local in about 45 minutes. So here's somebody who you know, has this problem. Obviously you can see it's pulling down her lower lip, pulling down her chin. She's very, very grateful that we've gotten her this far, and just that little touch-up makes a huge difference because each time she really can't lift her leg even to even, even to 90 degrees. This is a girl, doesn't seem like a big deal, but again, this upper eyelid is, is burned, the lower eyelid is burned, and she can't close her eyelid. So at night, the eye stays open, she gets a corneal, she can get a corneal abrasion, it's red all the time, so she doesn't have a really bad corneal abrasion yet, but she is at risk for something like that, which, again, she can go blind in that eye. So even just doing a small skin graft above and below on her eye will make a huge difference for her, and that's what we did on this trip. This is someone else who this back of the hand used to be stuck here. So picture, take this the back of your hand and put it to here, and your fingers are now pointing this way. So, um, Last year, they put a skin graft here and now brought the hand to this level. And what we did is now we did all the fingers, and now the person, after the surgery, about three hours, their hand is now like this and they can use it. And it's actually a big deal because um, that person only has one hand, so they really can do a lot of manual labor things. They can only do manual labor. And this hand is just kind of a helping hand that they can use. Having two hands will allow them to get a better job or even, even work. You can see this is where the graft is that was originally put in. It's another gentleman. Um, he's had several surgeries already uh, by the, the, the Burn Hospital, and uh, uh, you know he, this was all open, so he did a giant flap from his back. And uh, this trip, we uh, we wanted to do something about his eye. This trip, we really couldn't. Um, 
but I think the next trip will probably do a little bit more on his, um, his other eye and, and see what we can do to uh, maybe get him a prosthetic eye for the other side. I thought that was a prosthetic eye. That wasn't prosthetic. It's, it's not functional. Um, this is another girl with this burn where her chin is attached to her chest through that synechia. We fixed that with a very small graft and a um, Z plastic. Right there. You can see post op, no fix. And this is the gentleman with his mouth. That's as far as he can open his mouth, so he really has trouble eating. And uh, we did a full thickness skin graft to the side of his mouth and fix that. This is a girl who, she can't lift her arm past this. And you can see it here, the burn has fused her arm to her side. And also, you can see here, this is her face, that's her eye, and you can see it's also fused her neck to her chest. And what we were able to do is, this is her armpit, and we were able to do a flap, some skin grafts and all that together in about two and a half hours we're able to have her arm now so now she can move it freely up and you can imagine how difficult that would be to go through life where your arm is stuck here and you can't really do anything with it and it's difficult and this is another uh, a little girl that we're able to uh, help out obviously it's um, more of a cosmetic rather than functional issue but you know for someone like this that's her identity and she's you know, she knows that she was made fun of at school, and that's how people identify her as a girl with the black over her eye. And she would rather be identified by who she is. And um, she said it's difficult making friends, and, and, and people make fun of her. So what we were going to do when we did this time is we slowly just take um, the skin away and put full thickness skin grafts, and eventually she'll just, we won't be able to affect the upper and lower eyelid because it's hard to reconstruct that in the same way. But she'll just have a small patch over her eye, such that it, it, it'll be like she's wearing mascara or just has a little bit blacker on her eye. It won't be as to the same extent. And this is a guy who came in. First thing I told him that you have a great head of hair. <laughs> <laughs> this guy has great hair. <laughs> um, but uh, he said, thank you. And he said, well, can you keep it my lip. And I said, sure, we can fix it. He's been like this his whole life. He said he, he has never had a girlfriend, he can't get married. Um, and he said, can you fix it? And I said, absolutely. And he was amazed because his parents told him that he went to the doctor and they could never fix it. And they couldn't really afford it, I think. Still a great guy here, though. <laughs> And you'll see, when he's done, we fixed his nose, we did a little rhinoplasty on him, and we fixed his lip. And he's going to come back next year, maybe we'll do another little revision, and he's going to look great. And here's my little guy. Aww. By the way, please note, still completely unimpressed. <laughs> um, what's interesting, too, is you can see, when, uh, when you're in the hospital in India, there's no cafeteria, there's no food, there's no pharmacy, there's just a bed. And your whole family lives on that bed with you and has to bring you food. If you need medicine, you say, go get this medicine. They have to go find the pharmacy, get the medicine from the pharmacy, bring it back, and then you give it to them. Um, and, if, and if there's more family members, they sleep next to the bed, under the bed. Um, so it's, it's being in the hospital in India is a little different. Yeah. And here he is. The lip is fixed. He looks a little bit happier, but not. <laughs> also a great head of hair. <laughs> okay, and this is our little girl, and you can kind of see the operating room has beautiful windows, and they're getting ready to put the patient to sleep. And, and the reason I show this picture is that it's not, um, it's not a one-person sort of effort. And, and be, to be completely honest, my part is the easiest. I go and I do surgery, and I take pictures, and I eat Dunkin' Donuts, and <laughs> I, you know, hang out and talk to the parents, and the real heavy lifting, the shoveling of coal into the engine, is done by everybody else. So I just want to point out that this is really an organization that survives on the donations of the people who are able to buy the equipment, who are able to 
build the hospital, to pay for all the anesthesia uh, equipment that we need. We, we show up, we show up with 25 boxes, okay? It's almost like it's like a mesh unit. We can set up in the middle of an empty field if we have to. And it's really, uh, the team is 12 people. And uh, what's interesting is they give the, you know, the doctors seem to take all the credit for everything, but it's really, we do the smallest part. The reason I show this picture is, I've been to that place now, this is my fifth time, and this is the old hospital. The old hospital was someone's house that they rented and is now condemned. So that's where we used to operate in the kitchen. And the recovery room was the living room. And to show you the sacrifice that Dr. Cush and Yogi make, Dr. Cush um, rented his house, the house next door, and when we came to do surgery, he would take all the furniture out of his house and either put it in the backyard or move it to his bedroom and set up his living room as the post-op area. And, um, and then we'd be to operate for two weeks in this place, um, you know, and it was, it was basically a house. And now we have a beautiful hospital. I just want to show you the difference of really how far this particular site has come. Uh, it's amazing. And this is the post-op, and again, this is somebody, this is, uh, his leg was, was stuck bent, and now he straightened it out and then put a cast on it, and uh, that, that cast will come off in a week and he'll be able to walk. Mm -hmm. <laughs>